So Dr. Zaki is our final presenter. I'm really excited to hear from her. When we were chatting a while back, we were coming up with some ideas for this presentation. And I really do think a lot of doctors are going to gain a ton of information from Dr. Zaki. Dr. Zaki is a board certified fellowship trained eye physician and surgeon who specializes in cornea, cataract, and ocular surface disease. She's a managing partner at the Desert Eye Specialist in the greater Phoenix area, and she has a true passion for delivering outstanding patient care. She grew up in upstate New York, raised in a family of physicians. Then she graduated from the University of Michigan with a degree in neuroscience. She then went to medical school at the George Washington School of Medicine, and when she was there, she was class president. Upon graduation, she completed her ophthalmology residency at Boston University, and she was selected to be chief resident. Finally, Dr. Zaki completed her fellowship in cornea, anterior segment, cataract, and refractive surgery in Houston, Texas. She was one of two physicians selected for this year for this program, which was recognized as one of the top cornea fellowships in the world. She is also currently the president of the Phoenix Ophthalmological Society and assistant clinical professor of ophthalmology at the University of Arizona. Dr. Zaki is not only a phenomenal surgeon and amazing doctor, but she's a really wonderful person. So any doctors that are here in Arizona that don't know Dr. Zaki, you need to talk to her because she is awesome and she is incredibly smart and I cannot wait to hear from her. Welcome, Dr. Zaki. Thank you. Well, oh, that's quite an introduction. I hope I can live up to it. <laughs> Well, thank you all for having me today. I'm really excited to talk about um, advanced dry eye. Um, and so we'll get right into it. Um, I am a consultant and speaker for Allergan, Cala, um, Dompe, and a speaker for Sun. So we're going to talk about new levels and new devils. Um, as we know, the dry eye space has exploded in the last several years, and there are so many treatments now. The question is what to apply when, right? It can get really overwhelming. And we don't wanna just throw the kitchen sink at our patients. We don't wanna just, okay, this didn't work, let's try this. Because we wanna instill confidence in our patients. We want them to feel better. And we wanna to get to a place where um, our patients are, are improving. Uh, so this is the roadmap of the talk today. First, we're gonna talk about our exam because ultimately I'm gonna walk you through your exam with your patients because I truly believe that's gonna be the roadmap to success. We're gonna talk about different therapies and treatments, and then we're gonna go into case studies if we have some time. Okay, so what to do? Patients come in to see you. They've already tried various different gels and tears and ointments. They don't feel any better. They're clinically looking worse at the slit lamp. What do we do next? Where do we go from here? Right? Isn't this how we feel in clinic? There are so many different things. Do I plug my patient? Do I put my patient on steroids? Do I add a long-term anti-inflammatory? Anti, um, do I compound something? Do I go to their lids? Do I put an amniotic membrane? What do I do? Because we have so many options, right? But in order to navigate this, we have to know what the problem is. And that's really the fundamental of everything. We need to be able to do a comprehensive exam so we know exactly what the pathology is, so we then know how to address it and then be able to implement all these incredible therapies that we now have at our access. So, and this is a wonderful slide, and I'm going to um, mention some studies. Um, I will add um, my um, citations later. I'll, I'll, um, I can add the slide where all these came from. But in um, 2017, Milner et al. in the um, current opinion of ophthalmology came out with just a fantastic study called the dysfunctional tear syndrome. And it kind of nails everything. And if you look at this, we know that ocular surface disease is multifactorial, right? If we just approach it from one aspect, we are missing this picture entirely. We've heard this over and over again. This is the theme. We know it's multifactorial and therefore we have to address it as such. We can see here blepharitis, aqueous deficiency, exposure related dry eye, goblet cell deficiency. All of these things are a vicious circle, but they all culminate into the same thing, which is oftentimes patient discomfort or sometimes not, because we all know that signs and symptoms don't always correlate, right? 
but it's dryness, burning, stinging, the things we hear day in and day out. We're gonna talk about a systematic approach. And what I want to walk you through is this is how we are going to assess every dry eye patient that comes into our clinic. Because if we have a system, we have a process. If we have a process, we know the pathology, and then we can tailor our therapies accordingly, right? And not just throw the kitchen sink at our patients. So what we're gonna do, and I encourage you to do this every time, look from the outside in, start with the lids, start laterally, move your way centrally, then look at the conge, then look at the cornea, then take into, a, you know, take into um, mind all the other systemic things that can also impact our patient's symptoms. So very, very, very essential that you do this every time you see your patients. Now keep in mind too, I'm gonna to really focus on the exam. I've kind of bypassed the questionnaires and the other ancillary testing that you can do in the office with tear osmolarity and MMP9 detection. And I can talk about that with any of you who are interested later, but I really just wanted to focus on honing on to having a system when you see these patients in terms of your clinical exam. So again, we're gonna talk about eyelids. We have beat that. I think you've seen, you've heard the illustration all morning. We've had some incredible talks this morning about anterior posterior blepharitis, meibomian gland dysfunction. We're gonna talk about the mechanical factors that are involved in the conjunctiva and how that can lead to dry eye, goblet cell dysfunction. We'll talk about the cornea, tear quality, tear quantity, and the things that we look for, stain patterns, inflammation, things like that other nodules and things that we can see on the cornea that may be impacting the exam. And lastly, systemic disease and what could be impacting our patient's symptoms. So let's start with the lids. And again, I'm gonna take a slightly different approach. So with eyelid evaluation, the first thing you wanna do, even as you're introducing yourself to the patient, look at their face. If you can't see their face, have them pull down their mask. Maybe there's a Bell's palsy we're missing. Maybe there's a facial droop we're not seeing. Pay attention to how many times they blink. Pay attention if they blink completely. Pay attention to all of these things just by looking at them. And all of that assessment can be a quick couple seconds, even just as you're saying hello to the patient. Next, you wanna look at lid position, obviously at the slit lamp, right? We wanna see is their lag ophthalmos. We wanna to listen to their symptoms. If they're telling us we're waking up in, in the morning and their eyes feel like they're so dry, we wanna potentially assess for nocturnal lag ophthalmos, right? We wanna look obviously for the ectropion and the entropion because we know that those things can affect eyelid, the eyelid position can affect whether or not the eye is exposed. Lower lid laxity and retraction. I feel like this gets overlooked all the time. As patients age, we lose elasticity in our skin. The lids start to droop. When we start to see inferior scleral show, that is not normal, right? Look at the stain patterns right at those aspects because those are the things that could potentially be leading to discomfort. And sometimes those things cannot be treated medically. If there's enough laxity and enough exposure, no matter what you do, they're not gonna get better, right? Because it is now a mechanical issue. And that's when you wanna partner with your oculoplastic surgeon and get the lids in a better anatomical place. So very important not to lose sight of that. Also floppy eyelid syndrome, right? And that is exactly what Dr. Blumenstein was saying earlier. Um, you wanna pull on the lids. You wanna see what the lids are doing. Are they easily averted? Because is this somebody who's burying their face in their pillow as they're sleeping and their lid is up and their eyes exposed? Also keep in mind that there's a very high correlation between floppy eyelids and sleep apnea. So these are also things and patients who have sleep apnea are often doing what at night? They're hooked up to a CPAP, right? forced positive air blowing into their face. So these are other things we wanna pay attention to. And other mechanical issues for malposition, do they have some sort of fungating lesion on their lower face or their cheek that's pulling their eyelid away? So we wanna pay attention to all of these things because all of these things potentially can lead to exposure, could potentially lead to inflammation, and ultimately ocular surface disease indirectly. So very, very important to keep that in mind. So we talked about anterior blepharitis. Dr. Whitley did an incredible discussion about that. So I'm not gonna kind of beat a dead horse here, but very, very important to pay attention to the lashes, pay attention to collarettes, to pay attention that there, if it is in fact demodex, we want to address that. 
We know that there's a higher correlation of Demodex in rosacea patients. They oftentimes go hand in hand. So you have to have a very high suspicion. And this goes back to paying attention to their face. If they're pulling down their nose and they have severe rhinophyma or these telangiectatic vessels on their face, this is an indication that you could also be dealing with rosacea. So you have a very high level of suspicion when you see these patients. Um, and, they, and we also know that the level of Demodex goes up as we age. So those are two very important things to keep in mind. And then again, we want to look at what the cause of the anterior blepharitis is because then that helps us gauge and direct our therapies. So if in fact it is infectious, inflammatory, we know hypochlorous acid works. If we're worried about staph infections or staph epi, um, we want to start adding antibacterial, antibacterial therapy, tea tree oil, exact, everything that we talk about. But also keep in mind that the lids can also manifest allergy. And I can't tell you how many times patients come in to see me where they have severe allergic dermatitis, atopic dermatitis, which again shows inflammation in the eye. It's not always dry eye. Very important to recognize that. These patients look different. They have what we call those allergic shiners, right? The skin looks kind of crepey. So these are things we want to address. We want to treat that. Topical steroids, very helpful. And in some of the more severe patients, even a topical tacrolimus, because that again will help to decrease the inflammation that's on the skin and ultimately in the eyes. Posterior blepharitis, again, we've spoken about, but again, I'm taking you through the exam. So this is something as you're doing exam, first, we've looked at position, right? We've looked at all those things we talked about. Now we're looking for the, at the anterior aspect of the lid. So we're looking at the lashes. Now we're moving a little bit further back on the lids. Keep in mind, first thing to look at, look at lid contour. Are we seeing notching? Let's look at the glands. Where are the glands sitting on the lid? Are they posteriorly displaced? That gives you an idea of chronicity because the more, more posterior these lids are displaced, right? The longer this has been going on. We are now actually getting anatomical changes at the level of the lid. Look at the telangiectasia. Look at the lid, look at what's pouting. Always, always, always press on the lids because you'll get a sense then of what's coming out, right? And how quickly and easily. And you might get maybe out of five glands, you might only get two express. So again, nothing trumps your slit lamp exam. We have all of these incredible fancy machines and other diagnostic tools. But I tell you, if you follow a very systematic approach, you won't miss a thing at the slit lamp and nothing trumps that, right? All these other tests are simply going to support what you already know based on your exam. So very important to keep that in mind. Um, and you wanna see how many glands express. If you're gonna press say on five, do only two come out? This gives you a sense of exactly what the state of those glands look like. You wanna look for again, brush marks, telangiectasis, um, and, and again, really important. And I always, I always note this. I always note whether or not the gland is thinned whether the gland is thickened, whether my glands are posteriorly displaced, if they're inspissated, I look for notching and I look for tel telangiectasis. All of those things, again, give you the chronicity of what's going on. When you see that, you know you're dealing with significant meibomian gland dysfunction that has to be addressed. And we know, we've heard this all morning, over 80% of dry eye involves the lids. So it may be a lid inflammatory condition, it may be lid malposition, that may be a factor. So this is why, again, I encourage you to be very systematic in your approach with these patients as you're evaluating them, always from the outside in. One thing I also wanna mention, let's go back here. The other thing that I see all the time, so I practice in Sun City and Sun City West, and so many of my patients come in with tattoo liners. Very important to pay attention to that. Tattoo liner is really interesting because not only do you get the toxicity of the glands from the dyes, and Dr. Perryman did some incredible studies with this, but it's also the micro trauma of the tattoo. So I always warn my patients, especially when they have really severe um, eye disease, to really just say, hey, look, I know this is convenient, 
but you're killing your lids and you're killing your glands by doing this. So please stop with the tattoo liner and I will make it a point. Also with some of the new things, you know, with the new lashes and new things that we're doing to the surface, all of these things can also contribute to a lot of inflammation at the level of the lid. So it's really important. I always encourage um, makeup removal. Obviously, you know, I know these are interesting conversations to have with our patients, but to really ask them, what are you using? And so there are a lot of now eye friendly um, makeup that's out there. Um, one developed by Dr. Hillel Campo called 2020. Um, fantastic, where it's all just very eye healthy um, ingredients. Um, and so I encourage you to have these discussions with your patients about these things, especially when their lids are not in such a great place. The other thing I will mention, and I get this, I get this all the time, is always keep in mind too our prostaglandins. I see a lot of patients referred into me from glaucoma, obviously, with um, who are on prostaglandins, and of course, you know it's first line therapy for glaucoma management, right? So the majority of our patients who have glaucoma are on some sort of prostaglandin. But keep in mind, prostaglandins can really affect the surface. In fact, there's, you know, a condition, prostaglandin-induced orbitopathy, where we know there's fat resorption and you can see the telangiectasis. So that is something that you really want to pay attention to also is what medications are they taking? Because sometimes these medications can also impact the lids and the ocular surface in general. Okay. So again, we want to look at the status of the glands. Mybography, I think, has really been a game changer, not only for those of us who already know what we're seeing at the slam, but it's really to show patients, right? What's the reaction our patients get when you show them their picture? They're mortified, right? Oh my God, is that my lids? What can I do about this? So my mybography, if anything, is very, very helpful to just illustrate the disease process to the patients because this picture is going to um, tell the patient so much more than we could ever verbalize. So that's where I really feel that mybography has really helped um, in terms of, um, you know, and bringing this disease to a conscious level where patients can actually understand what's going on. Um, and again, you want to express the glands manually and look at the mybum. So we talked about this over ad nauseum. There are superficial lid cleansers, brooder masks. I agree with, Dr. What, what, with what Dr. Whitley said, that you want to make sure that you have a heated mask, warm compresses. They just don't work. And I'll tell patients that all the time. A brooder mask is a very simple way to kind of eliminate that where you know you're getting consistent heat for a consistent amount of time. Massage and blinking exercises, nutritional supplements, obviously. Um, topical treatments. I really do feel that even when you're dealing primarily with lid disease, all roads lead to inflammation when it comes to eye disease, eye ocular surface disease. Truly, whatever that root cause is, the end result is still a dysfunctional tear that's ultimately lending itself to an inflammatory process. And so I tend to put my patients on a long-term um, anti um, kind of an anti or immunomodulating or anti-inflammatory therapy, um, usually with uh, cyclosporin or lipidograss. Um, and lastly, I really find that oral doxycycline can help in these patients. Um, you just have to be very careful. I live in sunny Arizona. And so there's um, hypersensitivity to the sun. They can be more prone to sunburn. So you have to be very careful and make sure that you tell your patients this. When I was practicing in Buffalo, New York, that was not such a big issue. So again, in office treatments, as um, Dr. Whitley uh, so eloquently discussed, we can um, kind of go over this, but again, there's all sorts of different things that can be done. But there's some innovative treatments as well. So what if you've done everything and your patient's still not getting better? Well, there's some other therapies that can be done. And this slide is courtesy of Dr. Mark Milner that was also um, quoted in this study that I alluded to earlier. So you do need to partner with a compounding pharmacy, but I found that sometimes topical metronidazole or metronidazole ointment that is compounded is helpful because we know, you know, if you talk to a lot of your rosacea patients, they've been using metrogel on the face. So this is the same sort of thing. It's an anti-inflammatory. And this is especially helpful in patients that have ocular rosacea in addition to demodex, because we know the two are very highly correlated. So typically I will have them use this at night, once a day at night for, they can do it up to six months. And that you will notice that as you see them, there's less and less telangiectasia, less inflammation, but this is kind of a novel treatment. 
Other novel treatments, which I don't have too much experience, but have been reported are doxycycline drops, clindamycin ointment, tetracycline ointment. And we know why those work, right? They're anti, they have at a lower concentration act as anti-inflammatories. Topical androgen drops. So there's a lot of people have reported and there are reported studies of that being helpful in that it's a precursor to some of the steroid or to some of the hormones that actually are helpful in lipogenesis. So they actually help to make um, healthier um, fats, spironolactone and dapsone drops also. So now let's move on. We've kind of talked about the lids in terms of position, what to look for at the margin, let to see where the disease is and how to address that, right? We've got all sorts of treatments for the lids, but now let's have look at the conge. What is it about the conge that we have to look out for? So first of all, we know that the conge is where most of our goblet cells live, right? And goblet cells are very, very important in maintaining the ocular surface in a healthy, homeost and healthy homeostasis. So what happens when our goblet cells are lost in dry eye? Well, in our ocular surface, when we see this, we can best see this with lysamine green stain. The more lysamine green, the less the mucin. So we can see cells that are devitalized and you're seeing them here. Cyclosporin A, we know in the phase 2B study, showed an increase in the amount of goblet cells, but we also know vitamin A can help with that too. Vitamin A ointment, um, there are some that are commercially available, but it also can be compounded, and this can be given to people at um, bedtime that can also help with this goblet cell loss um, and dryness. Um, we don't see, you know, in our, you know, we know that vitamin A is essential for the development and maintenance of the goblet cells. And thankfully in our developed world, we really don't see vitamin A deficiency, although it can happen and we have to be aware of that. So again, in talking to our patients, patient history, really important to kind of keep this on a level of suspicion, especially with our gastric bypass, you know, patients who with a fat solubles can be having, um, can have a, a loss of some of the vitamins, a fat soluble soluble vitamins, especially vitamin A. So this is something you kind of want to keep in the back of your mind. What I think gets overlooked so often is conjunctival cholesis. And this is what they've now called mechanical dry eye. Very important to pay attention to this. And again, very easy to do, especially when you use my approach of looking from the outside in. So as you're looking at your slit lamp and you're looking at the, you know, you're moving from the lateral, lateral canthus into the medial canthus, pay attention to what the conjunctiva is doing. Is the conjunctiva just redundant and hanging out? on the lid margin, which oftentimes we see, and what's gonna happen? It's naturally going to disrupt the tear flow, right? So patients may complain of tearing. If you pay attention to the stain over the conjunctival cholesis or the area that's redundant, you'll see a lot of punctate stain on the conch. So it's showing you the chronic irritation that's there, right? And if you ask patients, oftentimes they will complain of foreign body sensation. If you ask them to just pull down the lid, and the conge goes back into place, oftentimes the foreign body sensation goes away. So this is something very important to pay attention to on, the, on your exam, because sometimes the cholesis can be enough to cause enough disruption, tearing, inflammation, and it's mechanical. So we want to pay attention to that. Dr. Flugfelder had a very elegant paper in the International Ophthalmology Clinics in 2017, where he actually talked about a diagnostic classification of the tear dysfunction. And he talked about conjunctival cholesis. And what was very interesting, I thought a very salient point in this, is that the cholesis creates tear disruption. And we oftentimes will see cholesis kind of medial and nasally, right? And so then the tear just kind of hangs out on the meibomian glands. Well, if you have a tear that is completely imbalanced, that's full of cytokines and interleukins and all of these inflammatory mediators, what is going to happen to the eyelid margin as the tear is just hanging out longer on the margin? It's going to worsen our meibomian gland dysfunction and our lid disease. So that's why it's really important to address this. So there's many different ways to do it. We can start very conservatively, right? Just start and initiate anti-inflammatory therapy and see if the patient feels better and kind of watch where that's going. But more importantly, if that's not working, 
then we have to be a little bit more invasive. Um, I find I will kind of stage it. And if the cholesis isn't a, a tremendous amount, I will actually do an in-office procedure of conjunctival cautery, where I'll numb the patient with lidocaine gel and take the excess conjunctiva and cauterize it. And by doing that, what I'm doing is essentially shrinking the conj, right? So now I'm re-establishing the contour of the eye and decreasing this mal, you know, direction of the tears. Now, if the cholesis is too much, and obviously I'm not going to cauterize like crazy, then I'll take the patient to the operating room. And there's many different ways to do this. Um, one of the techniques I find, um, which was described by Dr. Doss, is um, a paste and snip. Very simple. We just make a small incision in the conjunctiva, add some um, um, to seal glue, fibrin glue, take the conge and basically... Um, um, take all the redundant conge and hold it and then just snip away the excess and the glue just kind of holds the incision together. It's a pretty quick and elegant way to do it. Some people prefer to just cut it all out and put an amniotic membrane in there. So there's many different ways. But my point is, is that if it is too excessive, then it does need to be addressed surgically. And this will then help to really resolve symptoms. So again, we're paying attention to the con, we're looking at goblet cell, and we're also looking at conjunctival cholesis because those two things can really factor into our clinical exam. So we know how to stratify or strategize what we're gonna do for our patients. So what do we need to watch out for, right? There are some watch outs that you just, there's, we cannot miss these because they can have dire consequences for our patients. So allergic, um, atopic care to conjunctivitis, we recognize that we want to get to the heart of where the allergy is. We might need to partner up with an allergist or primary care, but we want to address that. Pterygia can cause discomfort, can cause inflammation. If it's to the point where it's really um, significant enough, it would be a good idea to refer out and have the patient have that removed. But two things I really want to higher, um, highlight are superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis and OCP. These are things absolutely you always, I mean, SLK more so, OCP hopefully you don't see very often, but SLK very, very important to keep that always in the back of your mind, which goes along when we do our clinical exam. As we're lifting up the lid, we're looking at the conjunctiva. And SLK patients will often have irritation and redness in the upper bulbar conge. You'll see these almost very long straight vessels and you'll see overlying stain and you'll see stain at the limbus superiorly. Always have a high level of suspicion for this because if you don't look for it, you will not see it. And this can be actually very, very, very easily treated. It can be treated by Again, anti-inflammatory drops, cyclosporin, um, plugs. And again, if the conjunctiva at the, at the level of, um, on the bulbar conge is so redundant, it can actually be cauterized and shrunk. And oftentimes patients will do remarkably well with this. But what I would caution, or what I would actually tell you when a clinical pearl for me is that when I'm talking to patients, watch how they blink. It's really interesting because SLK patients, it's almost like their upper lid gets caught a little bit. It's not like this smooth blink. And so you really want to look at them just as you're talking to them, how they're blinking. They will describe symptoms of foreign body sensation. Photophobia is huge for them. I had a patient that I met once who had an SLK so severe. Um, she was miserable. She couldn't stand any light. And what broke my heart is when she was telling me this story, that she and her husband were building a beautiful house in Sedona and their biggest arguments were that she didn't want windows because she couldn't handle the bright light coming into their house. So these are things that you have to, when patients tell you these stories, that should be triggering something like, I need to look for these things because oftentimes there's a cause. OCP is another thing. This is a more blinding, severe disease. Obviously, when you're pulling at the lids, you want to look for any symblepharon. If you see anything like that, conjunctival foreshortening, any issues at the, limbo, um, at the limbus, scarring, panis, things like that, this is something you can't sit on. This is, an, um, this is a, a systemic disease that has to be treated systemically. And if not treated systemically, it can be blinding. So this is something you do not want to miss. If you have any level of sus suspicion, you send it out for biopsy and that's ultimately how it's diagnosed. So let's get to the cornea. So we now, again, to review, we've talked about the lids, we've looked at position, we've looked at the eyelid margin, we've looked at different causes, we've looked at different solutions, right? We've talked about the conge, we've eliminated mechanical dry eye. Now we wanna get to the cornea because again, nothing trumps your slit lamp exam. 
So what are we going to say? We look at the cornea and we've got, again, an approach. So the first thing you want to do is you just want to look at the cornea, right? But next you want to put some stain in there and you want to look at the stain pattern. The pattern is going to tell you a lot. You also want, you can use different stains as we talked about, and I'll go into that a little bit more. But you want to look, is there anything obvious on the surface? Am I seeing massive nodules that could be causing this discomfort? Am I seeing basement membrane disrep di um, uh, dystrophy that's creating a lot of irregularity? Am I seeing any kind of thing that's just obvious to me, right? At the same time, you want to look at the amount, the location of the stain, and you want to always look at the tear film and quality. We talked about that. How high is the tear lake? Are they different on each side? Is it sparse? What's going on with that? We want to look at tear breakup time. We want to look for debris in the tear film, right? All of these things, we want to look for saponification because all of these things about the quality of the tear film is also giving us a hint as to what the problem is. So this again was taken from that study by Dr. Milner. Um, I thought this was a fantastic way to kind of illustrate stain patterns. And so you can see here when you have diffuse punctate um, epithelial erosions throughout the cornea, there's usually that's pretty severe disease. But there's also some other patterns. Maybe if you look at the fourth one, medication toxicity, when you're just clustered in towards the nose or contact lens related, or again, superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis, like I mentioned just at the top, the stain pattern can often indicate where the disease process is, which will then help you tailor your therapies accordingly. So we've also talked about other stains, right? Listamine green, rose bengal. And so these are some really good examples. They stain unhealthy cells that don't have a mucus coating. And again, another illustration from the same paper of all of the different ways that staining can occur. And so that helps tune you into where the disease process is or what's going on. So we wanna look what might be causing foreign body sensation. I will tell you probably the number one thing that I see gets overlooked is basement membrane dystrophy. And I really, really encourage you to look very closely for it. Patients will often describe foreign body sensation, but they also may comply just blurry vision. Their vision's just not quite right. That's not the quality. And you look, if you look at the pattern and you look at the location, oftentimes it correlates. You may have a patient with some basement membrane dystrophy right smack in the center of their vision. It may be subtle, but it might be enough to causing enough disruption to their vision. So it's very important. And I find that basement membrane dystrophy is oftentimes highlighted with my fluorescein because you may not catch it when you look right away, but if you see the negative stain, which that second uh, picture highlights, you can actually pick up. And then what I encourage you to do is turn off your blue light and go back and look again with your slit lamp and you'll see it. So you always want to qualify where the basement membrane dystrophy is, because sometimes that just might be part of the problem. And if we can eliminate it, whether it's with a contact lens or um, send it out for a superficial keratectomy, that usually will take care of the problem. But that usually indicates the problem. And again, we know how to address our therapy. Topography is very helpful for this as well. I personally have a Humphrey Atlas and I have a keratoscopic image where I can actually take a placido desk and, and take a picture of the, um, of the reflection back. And so I have found it's incredibly helpful. If you look at irregularities within the reflection of the placido, that will oftentimes show you where the problem is. You can go back to your slit lamp exam and sure enough, find where the problem is. So I encourage you to use some of these tools you have in the office to help pick up on some, some of these subtleties because it's not always obvious. You have to have a level of suspicion. And again, the more comfortable you get, the more systematic you are with your exam, the better your approach, the more comprehensive, and you won't miss these things. Then there's more obvious things like nodular degeneration, right? That can create, and you can look at the stain pattern right above the nodule. If it's significant enough, those can be removed or covered up. Pterygia, basically, you know, because I am a cornea specialist, if the, if the, the uh, pathology is there, pretty much for the most part, I'm going to remove it. Okay, if it's indicated. So we've talked about, you know, kind of going through the slit lamp exam, looking for the obvious and the not so obvious things, but what do we do? When do we throw what at our patients, right? So our patients already been on drops and ointments. For me, I always, always, always start with an anti-inflammatory. So, and I will tell my patients, look, this is a chronic problem, okay? This is not going to go away. 
So it's only going to get worse. We know that ocular surface disease is chronic and progressive. So I will tell them if they are particularly inflamed, and I can see that at the slit limb, I'll tell them I'm going to start you with a short-term therapy and a long-term therapy. The short-term therapy is going to put out the fire. It's going to help calm everything down, but I need you on something long-term that's going to help continue to suppress that inflammation as we go. And I oftentimes will use the analogy of rheumatoid arthritis because then patients can understand this a little bit better. So I'll tell them what do rheumatoid arthritic patients feel? Joint pain, right? That's what they pretty much, you know, that's the number one complaint. So if they just take aspirin for their joint pain, what's going to happen to the underlying rheumatologic process in their system? It's going to get worse, right? And this is what I'll tell patients. So we are to the point where we need something that's going to be long-term, that's going to address the inflammation, keep that under control, and we can build from that. And that's what I want you all, I want to encourage you all to do is that Oftentimes our treatments are not, well, if this, then that. This didn't work, so now I'm gonna, we're gonna stop that and try this. Oftentimes we have to build on what we've started and that foundation has to be to address the inflammation regardless of what the root cause is, regardless if it's mostly coming from the lids, okay? And from there, we can add to it. So this is where maybe this might be a good time for plugs, right? So we've got the inflammation under control, patient is feeling, um, the, 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 the eye does not look particularly inflamed, but that we still have a very, very low tear film. I still have a lot of punctate erosions. This might be a good time to add punctal plugs. And I tend to be of the notion where I only add plugs once I've controlled the inflammation. This is not my first line because again, as Dr. Blumenstein showed earlier, and which is one of my favorite slides, because it's one from my, one of my mentors, Dr. Flugfelder, we know the tear film becomes imbalanced. We know it's full of cytokines and all interleukins and all sorts of inflammatory mediators. Why do we want to plug that and keep that on the eye longer, right? So we get the inflammation under control, then plug. And that tends to be the way that I address things. Ointments at night. I love high-low ointment. I think that's our um, Optate by um, Optase. Um, um, high-low night, it's got a little bit of vitamin A. And as we know that that's essential for goblet cell function. Um, we... Moisture goggles, I think are very underutilized. Um, we integrate a lot of that in our practice and we actually have it in our optical shop where they can be fitted for. Um, because as we know, dry eye and exacerbation of dry eye oftentimes can be situational as well. So I might have a dry eye patient who loves to be outside and when they go outside, it's just terrible when they come back in. So I might um, suggest that they do a pair of moisture goggles or in Arizona, when the heat is 125 outside, what's the first thing we all do when we get into the car? We blast the AC because we can't breathe, right? And so that air is coming right at us. So I find that um, moisture goggles can be very helpful in a lot of patients, especially if there's exposure related issues as well. Um, as we heard very eloquently earlier today, scleral lenses and bandage contact lenses. Um, we've talked about um, trigenomal stimulation for tear production and amniotic membranes. Amniotic membranes, I think, are incredibly helpful, but they are not for slime, right? So we have to reserve that again in our algorithm. We've now suppressed inflammation. We want to now increase tear production, but we want healthy tears. We might plug, we might try some ointments. And if we have patients with an exacerbation or it seems like it's worse, that may be a good idea then to add an amniotic memory to calm everything down and go from there. But this is not gonna give us the long-term control that we're looking for. It's something we keep in our armamentarium when we're having a flare or we have an exposure or more of it, maybe an epithelial defect or filamentary keratitis, something where we need an immediate fix, something that's gonna help, okay? So what else can we do? Well, we've got some other innovative things that are a little bit more involved, right? Serum tears. So I use serum tears quite a bit in my practice. Um, there's a company out of Missouri called Vital Tears that have really made this a lot easier where patients, um, a lab is sent to their house. Um, they can either go to a lab or they can pay a little bit extra to have somebody come to their house. They draw their blood, centrifuge it, remove the serum, add it to tears, and they use that. So I find serum tears incredibly helpful in some patients where no matter what we're doing it, they're still not feeling better. Another note would be protein um, rich plasma. Protein rich plasma 
um, is has some advantages over um, autologous serum. It's it's a little bit richer in concentration for growth factors and other anti-inflammatories, um, cytokines, and and it has a lot of uh, some other platelet uh, derivatives, um, and it definitely can be um, beneficial for required ocular surface restoration. Um, this would be more reserved for the more moderate to severe patients um, in dry eye. And you really do have to partner up with the local lab to kind of do this. Uh, Regenerize, as we know, which is um, a bio, it's bioengineered um, amniotic membrane extract. Um, it's a product derived from the human placenta, it has many anti-inflammatory and trophic properties. Um, and again, it's available through a company in Florida. Serum albumin is another option. So for somebody who may not be the best candidate for autologous serum, um, or you can't get the PRP, albumin is another option. Albumin is the major component of the human serum and it's commercially available in its purified form. And so it can be compounded in a 5% formulation and it can be used as a drop as an alternative to some of these other things. So we do have some more advanced things. Um, I personally agree that scleral lens would be a nice option. Tarsorophy is kind of, for me, again, a last ditch approach um, for my patients because it is quite disfiguring. And before when we didn't have other options, it was a good solution, but now we have so many more options. So what do we do with the flare? Say we have a patient who has been doing okay, right? We've got the inflammation under control, they're comfortable and they call you and they say, oh my gosh, for the last two weeks, my eye just feels like it's red and it's hurting. What do we do with that? Well, these patients we know are not going to be on this perfect trajectory course, right? Where we've calmed them down and they're good and we don't hear from them for another year. It doesn't work like that, unfortunately. Just like our autoimmune patients, right? Oftentimes they will flare and what happens? They'll have to take a dose of oral prednisone in addition to maybe their biologics and other infusions. So our, our ocular surface patients oftentimes are going to go this, through the same route. And so this would be a good time where we, again, would couple. Now we know that there are some medications out there, FDA um, approved and indicated for flares like Isuvis. Um, which is a, a lower dose load of prednal. Um, you might find, um, you know, you'll see how your patients respond. For me, I tend to follow them pretty closely. Um, I will start them on a two week course, but what if they come back to me and they're still inflamed? Well, sometimes they just need a little bit longer. So a lot of these medications are indicated for two weeks, but at times I have no problem keeping them on longer as long as I am following them closely right? Because you still, it, it, it may just be that they just need a little bit more time. And so oftentimes I will keep them on the medication longer if I am following and I will follow them every two weeks just to make sure they're going in the right direction. What I may do is start a stronger load of prednal and do that for a course. And if they're still just a little inflamed, not quite perfectly quiet, then I might step down to say a Flarex or um, an Isuvis for a little bit longer before I tape them, taper them off completely. So you're gonna find, and that's the beauty of this, is now we have many different steroidals and anti-inflammatories that are of different concentrations. So again, depending on what your exam looks like, you can then taper and tailor the course accordingly, right? Whereas before we didn't have so many options. So now you can use them as you need them. There's some compounded preservative-free formulations for some of our patients who are just intolerant to everything. Some, there's, there are some like that. Um, Low-dose dexamethasone and, on, and topical medroxyprogesterone. Medroxyprogesterone has been used primarily for patients um, who have corneal thinning um, because it inhibits collagenase, but there have been reports where it can be also helpful as an anti-inflammatory. So that is something, again, in your armamentarium that potentially could be used. And then again, amniotic membranes and amniotic membrane extracts. So what don't we want to miss? Masqueraders. These are very, very important not to miss. We've got medical mentosa, right? We've got toxicity from drops. How many times do we see patients with multiple medications or are using their drops, their artificial tears every hour? I'll actually ask them, what drop are you using? And if they can't tell me, oh, I'm using something, it's in a green bottle, you know. 
So usually if I have a patient who's on an artificial tear more than four times a day, I will insist they go to a preservative free formulation. Um, and I will tell them sometimes the toxicity that are in the preservatives can create more toxicity and more discomfort. If you're going to use your drops more than four times a day, you need to go to a preservative free formulation. Um, and also be careful for those patients who are on multiple medical, uh, glaucoma medications. Oftentimes I will try if I can to switch them to a preservative free formulation and just be in touch with their glaucoma provider that maybe we should try something else. Um, I've, you know, and, and I, I, I'm trying to still get a sense on how my glaucoma colleagues feel about this. I love the idea of some of these injectable prostaglandins that can bypass the surface altogether and the lids. Um, again, I think the dad, you know, a lot of them are still just getting comfortable as to whether or not they're comfortable going that course. But I have found to, again, keep in mind prostaglandins can really kind of alter the surface. Um, neurotrophic keratitis, this is something that I think is so missed. And we always have to have this in the back of our mind all the time. The obvious things are maybe not so obvious anymore. Say you see a patient who comes in with ocular, you know, who's a dry eye consult, or you're seeing a dry eye patient, and you notice that there's major asymmetry between the two eyes in terms of the punctate stain. That should really kind of raise a red flag when you see such asymmetry. Why is one eye look so different than the other? I always do test corneal sensitivity. It's something very easily done in the office with either a cotton wisp um, or with dental floss, or if you wanna get really fancy and get a cachet bonnet, you can do that. But I agree with Dr. Whitley, what he said earlier is that it's very important to test um, superior, inferior, nasal, temporal, and central. Um, and this will kind of give you an idea of what's going on because it's the nerves that are regulating the surface. And we know that over time, inflammation can affect, we can have a neurogenic or we can have, um, you know, neuropathy um, and, uh, and uh, injury to the nerves ultimately result, resulting in a neurotrophic keratitis. So you always have to have this in the back of your mind. There are three stages to NK. Stage one looks like dry eye. It's got diffuse punctate stain. Stage two and stage three is exactly what we want to avoid. We don't want to see non-healing epi defects. And if you have a patient come into you who had a corneal abrasion and it's not healing, that should also be in the back of your mind that there is a neurogenic, or there is a neurotrophic component that is impeding wound healing. So very, very important to keep that in mind. Um, so always test for that because stage one, if left is going to, may result in a stage two and a stage three, which can be catastrophic. Um, also, it's really important to pay attention to who might be at risk for neurotrophic keratitis, right? that uncontrolled diabetic or the person who's been diabetic for however many years, I often ask them, do you have neuropathy elsewhere? Do you have it in your feet? Because that will clue me in on the level. Um, in addition to that, multiple ocular surgeries, patients who have had refractive surgery, LASIK, things like that, um, retinal detachments. Again, if you recognize that there's a neurotrophic component, then now after we've done everything else, right? We've, we've put them on an anti-inflammatory. We're trying to replenish tears. We're trying to replenish surface. Maybe now we have to add a synedrament. Maybe now we need to put them on Oxervate to help with the neurotrophic keratitis so it doesn't progress so they don't end up with a stage two or stage three disease. Um, be careful of the masqueraders. This is something that I see quite a bit. Limbal stem cell deficiency dysfunction. This is something nobody, nobody really wants to deal with because we still don't have great therapies for it. You really want to look at the stain. And again, this is why your slit lamp is so important. If you see a funny whirl-like pattern that's sectoral, that's not dry eye. You want to look at the limbus and see what's going on with that. Be very careful in your contact lens wears and always look for that because this is something that needs to be addressed quickly. If there's simply dysfunction, oftentimes by coddling those limbal stem cells, right, and removing the insult and decreasing inflammation, we can turn it around. But if left, this neural, the limbal stem cell dysfunction can be very, very um, it can, it can cause sight problems. I mean, these patients can scar and they can lose vision. Also be really, um, again, really, um, suspicious in patients, especially glaucoma patients who have had, 
um, anti-metabolites with their surgery. Look at that emanating if they've got a bleb, kind of look at the area emanating from that. These are things you want to keep in mind. And again, by looking at the stain pattern, by doing a very comprehensive slit lamp exam, slit lamp exam you won't miss these things. Systemic autoimmune disease, I cannot highlight even, I can't highlight that more. I often will ask patients if they see a rheumatologist because one lesson I learned very early in my career is if they're in a systemic flare, their eyes will manifest the flare no matter what you do. It is essential, essential that the, syst the systemic inflammation is under control in order to get the eyes quiet. And that's always something I find that if I find no matter what I'm doing, I've, I've done everything. I'm, I've amniotic membrane, serum tears, anti-inflammatories, plugged. I've even cauterized, which I, I didn't talk about earlier, which um, I do quite a bit. All of those things. And the patient is still very inflamed. That when it, that's when it tells me something else is going on. And so I always ask a patient to follow up with their rheumatologist or their primary care doctor to do a blood panel to see what is going on. Because if there's systemic inflammation, it needs to be addressed. Otherwise, the eyes will never quiet. So it's very, very important. And there's oral secretagogues that you can put patients on, Evoxac and things like that for like, say that are un unable to make tear for those with um, Sjogren or um, Sjogren's disease. So there are other things that you can also partner um, with your primary care doctors and rheumatologists that say the patients are still so dry, systemic inflammation's under control, but they just need a little bit more. Um, systemic secretagogues can really help with that. They can help them make saliva and tears it comes with other issues, which is why you'd want to partner with a rheumatologist or primary care doctor. So let's just quickly, if we have time, case studies. Okay. So we're just going to go through a couple case studies and I, I'm sorry, I don't have great pictures, but I just kind of want to show you how these therapies build on each other, because this is what it looks like, right? No one thing. If we had just one treatment that worked for everybody, we wouldn't all be here today, right? But it's incredibly confounding. And that's why I'm just trying to impart with you that if you're systemic in your approach to the patient, you can be systemic in the therapies you're offering them. So this is a poor patient. She's 60 years old. She had a right-sided Bell's palsy about five years ago. Three years later, was discovered to have a choroidal melanoma and needed proton beam therapy now comes in because she has a cataract and she can't see. What do you do for this patient? Initially, she was sent for me as dry eye and cataract. And I thought, oh my gosh, so I'm looking at her and she's got a right-sided facial droop and she's had proton beam. So sure enough, of course, this patient had just severe stage one neurotrophic keratitis. So the first thing we did was we initiated Oxervate or Sunigemin just to at least try to stimulate those nerves to work. Um, after that, and, and concomitantly, actually, I had her on serum tears. I had her on topical cyclosporin. We put her on um, initially on steroids to calm everything down. I did punctal occlusion. In fact, I even did punctal cautery on her upper and lower cryopreserved amniotic membrane until to right before we got um, for surgery, because I really needed a relatively smooth surface to be able to figure out what the calculations were going to be for surgery. And so after all of that, we ended up getting a great result 2025, but she needed something long-term. So what did we do? We put her in scleral lenses. And so this is a patient that, as you can see, we built, right? So we addressed the fact that she was neurotrophic. We addressed the fact that her eyes were on fire because they'd been inflamed for so long. We did the punctal occlusion. She, thankfully she didn't have too much exposure in lag ophthalmos. Um, but we, in doing this, I just wanted to show you the number of things that were involved in her treatment to get her to a point that she could have surgery. And even after she had her cataract surgery, what needed to be done in the long term. So this is just an illustration again on how these um, therapies build on each other. Next case. This is a case that I just wanted to highlight a patient who had systemic disease that manifested in the eyes. So this is a patient I've been taking care of for a very long time. Ulcerative colitis was quiet. I saw her in clinic two weeks before looking pretty good. She calls me one morning and says, I rub my eye. Everything is black. Oh my gosh, come right in. Sure enough, she came in. She had a stage three neurotrophic ulcer in one eye and she had perforated her others. She rubbed her eye. Her iris was now plugging the perforation. Two weeks prior, she looked fine. 
These are patients. And the only reason I bring this up is because, again, to illustrate the fact that her systemic disease was so flared that in two weeks she went from looking great to perforating her cornea. So this is an indication of how much systemic disease plays in the eyes. So for her, obviously we had to get a rheumatologist back involved, get everything under control. I had to put glue because this is not somebody I could take to the operating room right away, right? Because if she perfed that quickly, the likelihood if I grafted her, she's just gonna melt again and it's gonna be a nightmare. And the last thing I wanna do is now create a much bigger opening into her eye, right? So she had um, glue with a bandage contact lens for months until we could finally get everything quiet till we could finally take her to the operating room, till we could finally do a successful PKP. So this is again, an indication of somebody who has autoimmune disease, who was quiet, flared and manifested in the eyes. Lastly, a patient with SLK. And this, I just bring this up because again, if you don't look for this, you are not going to see it. Patient chronic discomfort, photophobia. And this is actually my patient in her picture, intolerant to light. You lift up her eyes, you see this. With her, we were able to treat her for the most part um, topically. We gave her a topical steroid. She felt much better. Cyclosporin, punctal occlusion. And after doing that, I did conjunctival cautery to kind of calm everything down. And now if you talk to her, this is just all a distant memory. She's comfortable. So these are, again, just examples of ways that you, each patient is going to manifest a little bit differently. There's multiple causes that all culminate into inflammation and their ocular surface. If you do a thorough exam, always from outside to in, taking into consideration what's happening system, uh, systemically for them, you can then tailor your therapies accordingly. Keep in mind that therapies have to build. One therapy isn't going to work. So once you've added something, you want to add to it. You want to build on it. Okay, they may not get a perfect result by putting them right on cyclosporin or lifidograss, but by adding to that, at least I know foundationally, I'm addressing the inflammation. And from there, I can build and work on that to get them to a point where they're doing better. And with that, I think we conclude.